at various times I invite our, us to get on our knees, and this would be one of those moments I'd invite you, if you're here or at home, to get on your knees. Let's pray. If you're not able to get on your knees, at least bow your head. Jesus, this week we remember 19 years ago, planes crashing into buildings, watching them even literally as we saw one explode in as another building was already burning one of the twin towers. And then the plane flying into the Pentagon and, and then we hear reports of a plane crashing in Pennsylvania. And I know that fear gripped the nation. People from around the world died that day. It wasn't just Americans. In a lot of ways, the world was attacked. And for a brief moment, Lord, we seemed to unite. We even united in prayer as a nation. <laughs> Congress stood on the steps and sang, God bless America. But since that day, Lord, we've kind of moved past. We've kind of become more hostile. We're afraid because of this pandemic. We're told to social distance, which means we even stay away from one another. And our world is hurting. We need to be in your spirit more today than any other time. We need your spirit to work in us more than any other time. Lord, as a nation and as a world, we may need to repent of our sins more than any other time. God, you know the concerns that are on people's hearts today. Some without work, some who are sick, some who are just depressed, discouraged, lonely. God, you know the needs. Hear our hearts as we cry out to you. Thank you for offering to take our burdens. Thank you, Jesus. Take a moment, just right there where you're at. Maybe you're in your living room, maybe you're watching a computer, maybe you're here in the sanctuary. Jesus is listening. So silently, would you just talk to him? Tell him what's on your heart. He's listening. Frankly, I don't mind if 
while I'm preaching, you keep praying. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to do that. You can ignore me. And those of you who maybe just tuned in are saying, what happened to the sound? What happened to the sound? Nothing happened to the sound. We were just praying silently. <laughs> and it, it'd be cool to have everyone praying together and sharing conversationally and stuff like that. But I just know too many people wouldn't hear, and it's just not worth all that trying to conflict stuff, trying to make technology work when it's not already been that great today. But the beautiful thing is, we just had a chorus of prayer that God was listening to. And our God can hear every word, every thought, every concern, every praise. Thank you, Jesus. September 11th, President Trump shared these words at the site where Flight 93 crashed in Pennsylvania, in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. So today we pay tribute to their sacrifice. Who's he speaking of? He's speaking of the 40 brave men and women who, as he's referred, triumphed over terror and gave their lives in defense of our nation. Their names and their stories are forever inscribed on the internal roll call of American heroes. And there's a tower there, actually. He says, today we pay tribute to their sacrifice and we mourn deeply for the nearly 3,000 precious and beautiful souls who were taken from us on September 11, 2001. To the family members of Flight 93, today every heartbeat in America is wedded to yours. Your pain and anguish is the shared grief of our whole nation. The memory of your treasured loved ones will inspire America for all time to come. The heroes of Flight 93 are an everlasting reminder that no matter the danger, no matter the threat, no matter the odds, America will always rise up, stand tall, and fight back. While we cannot erase your pain, we can help to shoulder your burden. We promise that unwavering love that you so want and need, support, devotion, and the very special devotion of all Americans. On that September morning, when America was under attack, the battle turned in the skies above this field. Soon after taking off from Newark, New Jersey, radical Islamic terrorists seized control of United 93. Other hijacked planes struck the North Tower, the World Trade Center, and then the South Tower, and then the Pentagon. The terrorists on Flight 93 had a fourth target in mind. It was called our nation's capital. They were just 20 minutes away from reaching their sinister objective. The only thing that stood between the enemy and a deadly strike at the heart of American democracy was the courage and resolve of 40 men and women, the amazing pastors and crew of Flight 93. Donald and Jean Peterson were grandparents traveling to vacation in California. Dira Bodley was a student headed back to college. Richard Guadagno was returning from celebrating his grandmother's 100th birthday. Lauren Catuzzi Grancolas was three months pregnant with her first child. Every passenger and every crew member on the plane had a life filled with love and joy, friends and family, radiant hopes and limitless dreams. When the plane was hijacked, they called their families and learned that America was also under attack. And they faced the most fateful moment of their lives. Through the heartache and the tears, they prayed to God. They placed, placed their last calls home. They whispered the immortal words. I love you. Today, those words 
ring out across these sacred grounds and they shine down on us from heaven above. President Trump, September 11, 2020. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And when you think about it, one of the obvious places where we mourn is when somebody dies. God knows what it is like to say goodbye to a loved one. God says goodbye to his own son who dies on the cross. Jesus understands the pain of grief in an amazing experience where he knows that in moments he is going to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead, who's been dead more than four days. And the two sisters have come up to him, Mary and Martha, both, and if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And they're grieving, and there's people wailing. And you understand that, that in that day when you mourned, you didn't just whimper a little bit. You didn't just have a few tears down your cheek. In fact, if you didn't have enough people to wail out loud, you paid people to come and do it. Because you had to wail and cry. And, and, and that's what was going on around Mary and Martha. And here Jesus is listening in all of this. And, and the scripture says, when the shortest verses in the Bible says, what? Jesus wept. And he's weeping and crying. And he's moved to deep emotion. Even knowing two things. That in moments, he'll say, Lazarus, come forth. And in weeks or days, I should say, He'll die on a cross and rise from the dead, defeating the enemy of death. And yet, Jesus understands the pain of grief. The Father, God the Father, is a, is a God of compassion. And as 2 Corinthians says, it, the, the, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Some of you have already said goodbye to your spouse, to somebody that you loved and spent your lifetime with. And you understand the, the grief that comes with that. Some of you have sadly had to say goodbye to a child. And you know, it doesn't matter what their age, but if mom and dad is still alive and a child dies, even if you're 100 years old and your child is 80, it still hurts to see a son or a daughter die. I brought, brought with me, but I left it in the office, the, the folder from Cody Lund's memorial service. Cody's our nephew who died at eight and a half years old. His parents still feel that loss. They still think about what Cody would be like if he was alive today. In that little pamphlet, they included a prayer, the, the hand, praying hands on the front. On the inside, some of you have read the story, Footprints in the Sand, that we're not alone. That in the darkest moments, that when, it, when, the, when you see just the one set of footprints on the sands, that's when God's carrying us through our times of sorrow. God understands grief. He understands sorrow. You say goodbye to a relative or, or a friend, and that's happening even now with COVID. Uh, or as we all age, <laughs> as this congregation ages, we're seeing more of that happen. We've said goodbye to, to people who've been members of the church for, for decades. God understands the loss. And not wanting to degrade anybody's grief, but let's face it, to the person who's lived alone with an animal, or maybe even not lived alone, but has had an animal that's been there and been their friend and loved them and been kind to them and cared about them, even the loss of an animal causes pain. 
But doesn't God care about all of his creation? Someday he will restore the whole creation. All of creation is suffering from the pains of death because of sin. God cares about our pain. He cares about our losses. He, he feels what we feel. He never leaves us when we're in the middle of the valley. That's when he wants to show himself most to us. That's when he wants to hold us closest to him. That's when he wants to come beside us and just be there for us. And someday, and this is an amazing one, someday God will even comfort us in heaven. In heaven. Revelation 21, at the end, at the end, as, as victory is almost won, and finally it's there. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. There's also mourning, if you think about it, for the loss of things. Millions have lost their job. And how much grief are they feeling because they've lost their job? Remember Luke 15 describes several different forms of, of loss. There's the lost sheep. <laughs> See, Jesus cares about animals, doesn't he? But there's a lost sheep that's gotten out and, and the shepherd goes searching just for that one lost sheep. There's the lady who loses a coin, a coin of all things. Come on, that doesn't really that important, is it? But to this widow lady who has very little, that coin matters a ton to her. And then ultimately there's the loss of the son. The loving father who has two sons and one, the youngest, comes and says, Dad, no, you're not dead yet, but <laughs> kind of like the inheritance before you go. And he gives it to him. And he leaves and he squanders it. And Dad watches and waits. You see, Dad so much loves that son that when he sees him coming at a distance, that means he's waiting for him. He's watching for him. He's praying that he'll see him again. He runs out to greet him and has the big banquet. And the saddest part of the story is just that the older son who was there all the time who had all the food all the wealth in fact everything now belonged to him cannot come in and celebrate with dad even though he says but but your brother my son was dead and he's alive again and we've got to celebrate you see there's the loss of things that hurts us there's a loss of friendship or here's one anybody having some loss of health pain in your body, <laughs> any issues like that. Uh, there's the loss of dreams that we have. Uh, the, the dream to, to do something special, to do something unique. Uh, maybe it's to go on to college, maybe it's to stay in America longer. <laughs> there's dreams that, that, that we have that, that have come even from the Lord. And, and when, when things happen to interrupt that dream, we, we feel a loss, we feel grief. There's the people who have lost their homes and the buyers. And, and when you lose something that's so precious, so meaningful, that's in a sense sacred and, and a place of protection, there's grief and pain. And sadly, in our culture, there are many people who are experiencing the grief of the loss of a marriage, the breakup of a home through divorce, through adultery and other things. What's interesting is you look at our beatitude this morning, which says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I appreciate what John Stott said about it. He said, one might almost translate this second beatitude, happy are the unhappy. Amen. In order to draw attention to the startling paradox it contains, what kind of sorrow can it be which brings the joy of Christ's blessing to those who feel it? It is plain from the context that those here promised comfort are not primarily those who mourn the loss of a loved one, but those who mourn the loss of their innocence, their righteousness, 
their self-respect. In fact, remember, last week we looked at the very first uh, statement from Jesus in which he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are the poor in spirit? The people who understand that the only way for salvation is to recognize you need a savior. And, and you can do nothing to earn that salvation. You can do nothing to, do, to say, I'm good enough. God, let me into heaven. You have to come humbly and say, I'm poor. I don't have any way to pay for this except by what you pay for me, Jesus Christ. And this is the interesting thing. And um, I'm one of many pastors who has quoted this text at a gravesite. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And, and, and it's what a great promise, right? But here's the thing about this text. When Jesus was saying this, he actually wasn't speaking about death. He was talking about us mourning for our sin. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, who grieve, who weep, who have an ache in their heart, tears in their eyes because of their sin. John Stott goes on, he said, he spoke of mourning when he said that we can stand before the cross only with a bowed head and a broken spirit. Psalm 34, verse 18, the, the Lord is close to who? To the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Psalm 51, 17, one of David's other great confessional psalms after he's committed this terrible sin, not just of adultery, but he killed the husband of the little lady with whom he had adultery. And, and now he cries out, my sacrifice, oh God. Nothing else is going to be good enough. So my sacrifice, oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, mourning, the kind of mourning we're describing, starts at conversion. You remember after Jesus has ascended into heaven, Holy Spirit's come at Pentecost. And, and Peter's trying to explain to the people from the city, they've come all around there, what is going on? These people are drunk. He's like, oh no, they're not drunk. And he goes into this great, incredible message about this Jesus whom you crucified. God meant it for good. God raised him from the dead. And the people responded. Remember? The people responded. In fact, let me, let me quote from Acts 2. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the other apostles, apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That includes us. Amen. Conversion is that starting point where we say, okay, Jesus, I'm broken by my sin. You don't need some magical way of praying it. You just got to admit, Jesus, I'm broken. Jesus, I've sinned. Jesus, I've messed up. And I need you. And I need your forgiveness. You remember the story of, and this, this is a real situation, right? The, the Pharisee who's invited Jesus over for dinner. <laughs> and Jesus is laying there at the table eating. And what's happening? But this prostitute lady's back here crying over his feet, washing his feet with, his, with his, her hair. And the Pharisee's disgusted because doesn't he realize what kind of a woman is touching him? But the Pharisee, what he misses is that this woman needs Jesus. 
Um, conversion is that point where, where we weep, where we're broken for our sin. I probably don't quote Puritan pastors very often. But in London, there was a Puritan pastor named Thomas Watson. He wrote these words, To mourn only for fear of hell is like a thief that weeps for the penalty rather than the offense. Mm. We're not weeping because we're afraid of what's going to happen to us. We're weeping because we're broken by our sin. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I gotta share this story. The story from Dundee, Scotland. A young pastor in Dundee named Robert Murray McSheen. I'm probably saying that wrong, but he died at age 30. A lot of people in that community had come to know Christ because of McSheen's ministry. And a visitor went up to the town and wanted to know what was it that was so special about McSheen. Why do so many people come to know Christ in this little, little town? So he visited the old sexton in McSheen's church. And the sexton led the preacher into the rectory and showed him some of McSheen's books lying on a table. Then he motioned to the chair the evangelist had used, and he said, sit down and put your elbows on the table. The visitor obeyed. Now put your head in your hands. He complied. Now let the tears flow. That's what McSheen did. Next, he led him into the church, and he said, put your elbows on the pulpit. And the visitor did. Now put your face in your hands. And he obeyed. Now let the tears flow. That's what McSheen used to do. Jesus says that those who are heartbroken over their sins will find comfort, peace, forgiveness. Some of you, I'm sure, know the story of Chuck Colson. Great political figure from Watergate, Watergate years, a credible man of God, started prison fellowship. But in his book, uh, Born Again, he describes his moment as he's sitting in a car after he's gotten out of prison. That night, when I sat alone at my car, my own sin, not just dirty politics, but the hatred and evil so deep within me was thrust before my eyes forcefully and painfully. For the first time in my life, I felt unclean. And worst of all, I could not escape. In those moments of clarity, I found myself driven irresistibly into the arms of the living God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now think about that. Many of us have read the book of Job, and we've looked at Job's friends with a little bit of disdain and disgust. He kind of disrespected them, frankly. But you need to remember how the Job's friends came when they first found out the news. Job 2, verse 11. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. I know some of you are arguing, oh my goodness, but they like preached at him and they, they told him he was a sinner and this was all his fault, right? Don't miss what... What happens next? When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him, watch this, for seven days and seven nights. 
No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. The word here for comfort is the same word that we use for the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the one who comes alongside. It's the one who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death so we need not be afraid. Comforter is that encourager, that, that one who stands next to us and, and may simply stand there quietly saying nothing. Look at these friends for seven days. I, could we have done that? Most of us can't go to a funeral without thinking we have to say something to the person. We can't just go up there and just hug them and stand next to them. We've, we've got to come up with some, some word to give them. That's just with a few minutes. But for seven days, Job's friends, sit next to him, feel his pain, cry alongside of him, and say nothing at all. I know, they wore out after seven days, right? <laughs> and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's Jesus promising that when we're mourning our sin, what will he do? Come alongside of us and comfort us and forgive us. The Spirit, Jesus quotes this, right? Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Folks, God's calling us to mourn. Now, we have some people with us today who aren't Americans. He's calling America to mourn. He's calling the world. He's calling us to repent. To really mourn for our sin is to grieve over the fact that we are sinning against God. And to not take our sin lightly. Whether it's our habits that we give into and say, oh, well, the God doesn't really care, does he? Oh, yes, he does. Whether it's our disobedience where we simply don't obey his great commission, his calling to go and serve and tell our neighbors and love our neighbors and tell them about Jesus. Whatever it may be, we need to repent. Whether it's the millions of babies who have lost their lives through abortion, we need to repent. God is saying the blessings, the joy really comes when you mourn. When you mourn your sin. It's Ezra and Nehemiah both as they gathered with the people. They've come back from being exiled. And as they get back there, they, they're reading the law in Ezra. They're crying out to God. They're standing. Remember last week we said we're supposed to be standing while I'm preaching, right? They're standing for a whole day. They're reciting the covenant. And they're repeating God's promises and God's word. And they're repenting and they're grieving because of their sin. And we need to do that. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them 
and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. As we do this final song, I would urge you, bow your soul before Jesus and examine and let Jesus examine it. And is there something you or we need to repent of? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted.